So, so uh, let me introduce you to our new uh, to the next session and the new speakers. We got Dylan Sivan, and we have uh, Rowan Smith. Dylan is a um, senior software engineer at CACI. Mm -hmm. Did anybody have ice cream during the day? Oh, we got some ice creams. Thanks to CACI, we've got ice cream. So that's from CACI. Thank you so much. So round of applause. <laughs> good, good bike and good ice cream. He's currently leading a um, dev of uh, development of next generation weather observation pa platform for Met Office, and that leads me to Rowan Smith. Rowan Smith is a solutions technical architect and has delivered high profile complex technical projects. He is also a keen glider pilot. Any glider pilots around here? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm one. I'm not, but he's um, yeah, he's he's climbed heights of 19,000 feet. That's that's a massive achievement for a plane that doesn't have an engine. So that's that is great. Um, so we asked them to explain their talk badly before, and then they said that um, moving loads of weather from our room to someone else's room. So you know, just strap in. <laughs> we're gonna find out a lot more. And we did ask. Uh, Dylan, what his, uh, the book that had the most impact on, and he said, Mathematical Universe, which has been helping him to get to sleep for four years. <laughs> so you know what to do. Go home and order a book if you can't sleep. So uh, joking aside, we're about to find out uh, how weather can save your life, uh, knowing the weather can save your life. And if you don't want to be dealing with, um, with the pain of managing your servers, uh, strap in, because we're in for a great talk. There's going to be a demo as well, so uh, we're looking forward to it. Please give a warm welcome to both speakers. So um, we've never done a talk at a conference before, so before we start, we're going to get a little selfie with the crowd. Uh, so everyone, I think I've got most of you in there. Sorry if I haven't. Cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Rowan, and I'm a solutions architect for the Met Office, and I've been a, a technologist for the last 15 years, mostly as a, um, a full-stack developer, but in the last few years as a solutions architect. And for the project that we're going to be talking about, I'm the delivery manager as well as the architect. Uh, my name's Dylan, and I've been working for CACI for three years as an engineer, and I'm the technical lead for the project we're about to talk about. So the, the project that we're talking about is that um, is the third generation of the meteorological monitoring system and uh, hopefully you're going to see that uh, we think that, that serverless is ready for, for something like that. So AWS Lambda was released in 2014 and in the past five years it's, it's developed from a sort of shiny new tool on the block to what we think is a legitimate component for building large-scale applications. So hopefully we can show you that serverless really is ready for projects on the scale of this. So what is meteorological monitoring and why do you care? So um, meteorological monitoring is, uh, is the measuring of the atmosphere. Um, it's uh, sort of things like temperature, pressure, um, wind direction. And one of the interesting things is that we don't actually measure uh, the, the, say for example, temperature directly. Uh, if you look, think about the sort of the, the thermometer, the glass thermometer that you have at home, it's probably got alcohol in it. Um, don't drink it yet. Um, and uh, what's actually happening is that you're, you're measuring the thermal expansion of, the, of that liquid. So what temperature really is, is the, the vibration of, of atoms, but we can't measure that directly. So with the, with the thermometer, we're measuring the, the thermal expansion of the, um, of the alcohol, and we've got a gauge or a, a, a ruler, if you like, next door to that. And that's calibrated to give you that at room temperature, it's whatever, 20 degrees. So in our case, we use um, a resistor, and that resistor is, uh, is changes as the, uh, the temperature changes. And as a result of that, the, the voltage changes. <coughs> so we're actually measuring voltage. And pretty much all of our, if not all, of our measurements are done indirectly. So what we have here is a, a number of different weather stations, and they're located in different locations. So we've got a buoy on the left-hand side at the top there. And this is out to sea, quite a, a challenging environment. Um, we don't have broadband, we don't have mobile networks. This is you know, in the middle of the ocean. And also we don't have power, so we're using solar power to, to, 
to, um, to power the instruments. And we're also using uh, uh, satellite data to, to transmit that, the, the telemetry back to the Met Office. On the right hand top, we've got a light ship. You've probably never heard of a light ship, but I certainly hadn't. Um, this is a, an old decommissioned ship that is uh, anchored out to sea, and its primary purpose is to uh, operate as a, as a lighthouse, ultimately, uh, to, to stop uh, ships from, um, from running aground on uh, rocky outcrops. But its second purpose is that we put instrumentation on there. So we've got a, a, a number of sort of uh, temperature, pressure, wind, and, and alike that's um, on that ship. And again, uh, challenging environment, no broadband, etc. And then on the bottom left, we've got a, uh, the workstation of the, of the Met Office. We've got, uh, these are dotted all around the country. This is called a, an enclosure, and it's got uh, probably about 15, 20 different instruments, radiation, sunshine uh, measurements, uh, cloud height. And on the right-hand side, we've got a, um, a tripod, which we deploy to, to mountain regions. Uh, the, the bottom ones, we've got sort of, uh, well, certainly the, the bottom left, we would have power uh, from the grid. We would also have broadband. So you'd expect a, a different scenario for that. And then on the right-hand side, solar power again, but we'd probably be using uh, mobile phones for that. Um, one of the, the important things here is that the quality of the data here is very high. So you could go to the defunct Maplins and buy yourself a, a web station for £100, and so what's the difference between the, this and, and what we're talking about? Well, the weather stations that we have, they cost tens of thousands of pounds. Each instrument probably costs about two to three thousand pounds. And the, the quality is just uh, that much higher. We calibrate our, our, our instruments. So, you know, and we're, we're measuring to a very, very fine detail. Um, uh, and you'll, you'll find out in a moment why that's so important. So, um, why do we care about uh, meteorological observations? Well, something that's very topical at the moment is uh, the climate change. And uh, the climate scientists need a record to look back to see how it's changed. And so the Met Office has been recording uh, the weather for the last 120 plus years. And these instruments, these high quality data, is the, that, that uh, measurement, the, uh, the, the, the memory of the, of the nation's weather. So, you know, it's very important that these uh, climate scientists have, have access to this, uh, this archive, and this is where that, that information comes from. Also, um, the, um, it's, it's very important to you that it's probably, sorry, the, um, uh, it's probably saved your life as well, in that you, um, you have guidance issued by the Met Office. And that guidance tells you whether you can go out to sea, for example. You can choose to ignore it, but at your peril. The, um, so if you're a, a fisherman, that, that guidance would help you decide whether you want to go fishing. Um, in the past, we wouldn't have had that sort of uh, that option. We'd have gone out to sea in the hope that we come back. So many, many lives have been saved from, uh, from having meteorological observations. Um, we also care about the forecast, so the forecast allows us to, to, to make decisions of whether to, to have that picnic or you know, to, uh, to, to do that nice thing outside or to read a book in. And uh, what, how does that, those forecasts get generated? Well, we have a mathematical model at the, uh, the Met Office, and that mathematical model is predicting uh, what the atmosphere is doing. So the, the, the atmosphere is a fluid dynamic uh, sort of um, a situation where uh, a lot of different parameters are all interacting very, very complicated, and we use a supercomputer to, to, to uh, do that computation. Um, and to start that model, we need an initiation point, and these observations provide that initiation point. So to start the model, we say that these are the initiating parameters. It's currently 12 degrees in, in Bristol, for example. And then the model runs. And then once it has run, then we, uh, we actually verify the model was it actually uh, a very good, uh, was it a good model run? And we're doing that again with the observations. And then uh, something probably more closer to, to our hearts is when we want to go on holiday. If we, um, we you know, we, we're going to take a flight um, and uh, the, the airliners themselves, they'll, they'll use the weather reports, the, the, the guidance that we're, we're issuing and to make uh, decisions of whether, to, whether it's safe to fly. And if these observations stop flowing, 
uh, into the Met Office, we wouldn't be able to make those predictions. And um, it said that about seven hours, Heathrow would have to stop uh, working. So you can see that this system that we're talking about is very, very important. So uh, before we go into the nuts and bolts of the system and talk about its components, I thought we'd give you a little demo. <coughs> so I guess um, the name of the platform is called SurfaceNet. And SurfaceNet is a data processing pipeline. It takes the data from loggers uh, at these stations around the world and then converts them into uh, sort of useful observations that can be used downstream. So who might be using SurfaceNet? Um, so as Rowan's touched upon, uh, you might have climate scientists using the observations from SurfaceNet, meteorologists. You might even have insurance companies trying to work out if they've got, say, a big payout coming out because of some natural disaster. So there's a lot of uses for the data. Um, a specific set of users for this system in particular, or this user interface, would be the network managers for the system. And they'd be responsible for monitoring the health of SurfaceNet and making sure everything's running as it should be. So here we've got uh, sort of the hundreds of sites dotted around the UK and the rest of the world. Um, and each of those is um, getting in data from those sensors. So the sort of raw observables that Rowan talked about, such as temperature and pressure and rainfall. Um, so if we drill down into one of these sites in particular. No. Nope. Yeah. Um, so many dots. <laughs> um, so this is a, a more granular view of the health of a station. So on the left-hand side, you can see a number of uh, variable names. So from the raw observations that the sensors take, take uh, the data pipeline converts them into some more useful observations uh, using equations that the scientists have deemed useful. Um, <laughs> uh, the network manager is keen on basically assessing the timeliness of the data and the quality of the data. Um, so the timeliness, basically, whether data's arrived. <coughs> so you can see for temperature, air wet, which is basically the wet bulb temperature, uh, we've, not, we've not got any data arriving. Each of the, the green blobs basically indicates that that uh, variable has arrived and is of a good quality. Um, the blue dots indicate that the data has arrived but is of a suspect quality. Now, something suspect might be because uh, some of the raw observables that we used to calculate that were missing or those values in particular were slightly strange. So we can also drill down into the individual observations. So here we can have a plot of, uh, say, this is temperature for the last two hours. Uh, the idea of the system will be to hold all historical data for each of these variables. So t in 10 years' time, you'll be able to see the trend of temperature at this site for 10 years. Uh, we can also plot multiple, <laughs> multiple variables on. So we might be able to plot pressure as well. Yeah, go for that one. OK. Um, so here, I guess, the network managers can have a look at how the different variables are comparing against each other, uh, whether they can look at the trends and see, potentially, if there's anything anomalous going on at the stations, if there's, say, a reason why one of the temperature values is completely different to other, one of the other ones, and then potentially diagnose <laughs> an issue. As well as drilling down into the, into the data, we can also have a bit of a drill down into, ooh, those graphs have gone funny, um, have a bit of a drill down into, into the actual system itself. So we'll talk in a bit more detail about the uh, components that make up the system, but the main sort of compute that drives the pipeline is a set of lambdas. Now we have some throughput um, requirements that we need to meet, about 36 seconds of means that we're not meeting it right now, but I don't know what's happened. This is live data. So, uh. <laughs> um, but essentially, we've got um, data for each lambda as to how long the computer is taking. So I think we've got however many, nine lambdas in, in the pipeline. And we can use this uh, data to basically monitor where, where the pipelines are falling, where the lambdas are falling over, or where they're taking a lot of time, and try and sort of solve those issues. Because, well, yeah, at the moment, we have a few issues to solve, clearly. <laughs> um, We've also got a number of dead letter queues. Now, these queues uh, are for um, lambdas that have failed to process an observation. We push them into dead letter queues so we can look at where the system is basically falling over uh, and try and assess why that is so we can fix bugs. I know we've got uh, a load of failures at the top because actually one of the loggers is sending in a different telemetry format, which we've 
uh, not yet handled. So that's why there's 93,000 <laughs> failed messages in there. Um, yeah. <coughs> So we talked about that this is the third generation of the meteorological monitoring system. Um, what's wrong with the second generation? Well, so the second generation was, was built in, in 2006. Um, it's been running for, for a number of years. Um, and, you know, for, for most part, it's, it's done a good job. But it was um, uh, developed in, a, in, a, uh, in a, another era. Um, it, was, it was written as a monolithic system, and that has its own uh, sort of uh, problems. Um, for example, for total cost of ownership, where uh, we have a number of different groups that use that application, and it's very difficult for us to sort of bill uh, different parts of the Met Office to say that you know you're using this uh, and therefore you have to pay. Um, another is that uh, we had a third uh, party uh, deliver the the application, and they own the IPR. Um, and as a result of that, the, it's been very difficult for, for us to make changes. Um, it's, uh, we would have to go for a, a lengthy uh, procurement process for each change, and um, it's, um, it's ultimately the, the system has started to rust. Um, the, the actual uh, operating system that, the syst uh, <coughs> that it's running on is now quite out of date and we're looking to upgrade that operating system uh, for security issues. Um, we asked the third party to, to give us uh, a quote, and that quote was about a million pounds. So instead of investing that money in a like-for-like -like system, uh, we've chose to, to invest that, that into the, uh, to the next generation, the third generation of that system. Um, also, is the, the, the Met Office now has a, a cloud-first um, approach. Uh, because the Met Office recognises that infrastructure is not our, our uh, core business and we want to, to outsource that. So um, back in about uh, 2017, the Met Office initiated the, the um, a project to start looking at the replacement and uh, this project is SurfaceNet and that's where we are today. So out of the issues with the old system and uh, a developing new technological landscape came a set of new requirements for what SurfaceNet should, a set of new requirements that SurfaceNet should satisfy. Um, costs were a <coughs> big issue, naturally. Uh, it was very important that because of the large amounts of data that SurfaceNet would be consuming, and you're going to see some cool graphics about that in a minute. Um, cool. And... Uh, also, because all of this data had to be has to be stored for historical purposes, there was obviously going to be huge cost uh, when it comes to running the system. So it was very important that any sort of margin marginal gains we could gain when running the system were utilised. There's also uh, the operational cost to consider. So the project was going to be delivered by a DevOps team consisting of Met Office developers and also CACI developers. Um, but the teams responsible for uh, maintaining the system would be the developers, the Met Office guys who'd been part of the part of the building of the system. They'd also have other responsibilities going forward, so it was very important that the the amount of operational work they'd have to do to keep the system alive and keep it healthy was minimal. Rowan also touched upon how important uh, SurfaceNet was. Um, it's basically a critical piece of national infrastructure, and it'd have to be running 24/7. So any sort of maintenance that would be needed out of ours would be pretty expensive. So there was a real drive for the system to be as low ops as possible. Um, Rowan also talked about uh, being cloud first and to sort of maximise the idea that the Met Office wanted to focus on being, focus on data delivery and data analysis where their strengths lie rather than managing infrastructure. They wanted to take that further and uh, potentially go serverless first, first if possible. Finally, it was important that there was a dynamic, intuitive visualization of the system so that network managers could easily diagnose where issues were, and if there were any bugs, they could report them to people to fix them quickly. Hopefully, that demo was pretty dynamic. Uh, yeah. So Dylan mentioned about a cool uh, presentation or a slide about uh, numbers. Um, <laughs> I think that it's really hard to imagine numbers uh, after they get after, you know, maybe a million or something. Um, certainly my brain doesn't comprehend them. 
So we've made this uh, this this uh, slide to try and sort of give uh, some sort of anchoring on the numbers that we're looking at. So every hour, um, our system is going to be consuming uh, nearly 17 million observations. Now, imagine an Olympic swimming pool, and then imagine three of them, and then that's the number. Uh, th then uh, uh, scooping out a pint of water <coughs> from from the the, uh, the Olympic swimming pool, and keep going until it's all empty. That's the number of pints that is. So you know, I, maybe that anchors a little bit. <laughs> hopefully. Um, so then, uh, 300,000, uh, 300,000, sorry, three, million. Three, three, 300, 000, three, <laughs> 300 million, that's the one, 300 million observations every, uh, every day. Um, so the United States is a big country. Um, that's the population of the United States, you know, not a people. So then every month, uh, 13 billion observations. Now, I can imagine a football pitch, and I can kind of sort of start to think about how many blades of grass are on a football pitch. I mean, that's a mind-blogging number. Uh, now times that by 50, and that's how many blades of grass are in uh, 50 uh, football pitches. So then every year we're consuming uh, nearly 150 billion observations, and that's the number of stars in the Milky Way. Uh, you know, huge place, big, big numbers. So um, hopefully this sort of gives a, a bit of a demonstration of, uh, of how, uh, s you know, surface debt is having to, to deal with <coughs> such a uh, huge number of uh, observations flowing through it. So I guess we promised a talk on serverless, so that's where this will come in. Um, so the data <coughs> that we get through from the system, as well as there being huge amounts of data, it's very spiky. So we have 60 sites, man sites, that will report their data every minute at the top of a minute. So that'll be 31,000 observations. And then the rest of the 400 sites will report all their data at the top of an hour. So that will be 212,000 ob 212, observations at the top of the hour. So you've got this data coming in at the top of every minute. But for the rest of a minute, uh, there's no data flowing through. Uh, so it's, it would be a bit of a waste to have a system that was alive for the whole duration, basically, because there'd be a lot of uh, resource not being used. So that's where Lambda comes in. Uh, Lambda's been perfect for a spiky workload like this. Uh, with Lambda, obviously, you only pay for the compute as you use it. So we pay for the Lambda as it spins up to process those observations. And then while it's not being used, we're not paying for the resource at all. We also have uh, the demand changes from 400 sites to none in like a matter of seconds. So the ability for the lambdas to scale horizontally uh, or out of the box, basically, gives us a real advantage when designing the system. There's not a lot for us to do when, when it comes to provisioning what we need. We could compare this to a sort of server architecture. Um, you know, you might have to provision 400 or however many servers to deal with this sort of load. Um, but you'd have to have them, if you have them provisioned for the whole time, you'd be paying for them. Uh, for the duration of, say, this hour, and you wouldn't get the cost benefits of not having to pay for the runtime in between the minutes. You could try and warm them up and cool them down, but realistically, servers aren't going to be responsive enough to deal with a, a load that's fluctuating that quickly. There's also uh, the sort so that's, that's running costs and how we can save a load of running costs um, with serverless. There's also a load of operational costs that you can gain from, you can save from going for a, a serverless approach. Uh, with our lambdas, we don't have to worry about provisioning them. We basically just deploy our code, and they will get triggered. They'll get run. So all of that sort of infrastructural burden that might come with running a traditional server farm or running EC2s just goes away. Um, you've also, for a system this important and this big, so issues of resiliency and uh, uh, fault tolerance and stuff like that, um, when you're using serverless tools such as Lambda and the serverless databases that we'll talk about, much of that replication is done behind the scenes by AWS. So again, you don't need to spend operational time managing, developing, and yeah, maintaining that operational resource. So it's actually a massive time save from a developer's point of view and an operational point of view going forward. You've also got, um, with uh, these serverless tools, the, uh, the fact that AWS will be patching the software under, um, underneath. So they'll patch software, patch OS versions. If there are security vulnerabilities, it will be 
uh, their responsibility to patch uh, the lambdas, for example, and the databases. Um, the security model that you have with AWS is a shared responsibility model, so it's not absolving you of all responsibility, which would be great, but it's <laughs> absolving you of quite a lot more than if you had to manage your own servers and databases. So again, that saves time for the developers and the team and also going forward. So it's basically huge savings for, from an operational side as well as uh, running costs. So we wanted to go through the actual architecture of the system. Um, this is a, a, um, a reduced sort of um, view of, of the system, um, but hopefully it will give you a, an idea of what we're doing. So we talked about the sort of different um, uh, message formats. Um, we've got the, the land station. Now the land stations are, are as I said, they're, they're, um, they're using more traditional IP, so um, uh, broadband and, and mobile phone. And so, so we were able to use MQTT, which is uh, uh, the Internet of Things protocol, uh, or certainly one of them. So uh, each one of those land stations is seen as a, as a thing, uh, and um, it then connects to the, the IoT core. So the IoT core is, uh, is a component of AWS, which provides um, a serverless sort of solution for MQTT, as well as for the actual um, management of the um, of the certificates, so for those things can uh, securely talk to to IoT. Um, we then uh, send that message to a Lambda, which um, transforms that message into a, a standard format that we use throughout the system, um, uh, and then that goes on to an SQS queue. SQS is uh, the AWS's uh, queuing service, so that's not dissimilar to ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ. Um, and this allows our, our components to be to to be decoupled from each other. On the bottom hand, uh, bottom side there, we've got the marine. So I mentioned that the marine doesn't have traditional comms. We're actually using uh, a satellite provider, which then sends that data to us via email. Uh, we're using the Amazon's SES, which is the uh, 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 the simple email service. Again, uh, uh, well, I'm going to say that all of these components are serverless. Um, but the, uh, we don't have to sort of like manage all of that. Um, we just uh, receive the email and that goes on to the uh, marine transform. The marine transform is a lambda which um, is converting uh, various formats. There's, different, there's seven different message formats that come in from marine. The marine network is a very old network and uh, changes have happened. Uh, as a result, we've got seven different formats and we then convert them into our standard format which we pass on to the SQS queue. So the, the system is a, is a push system. Uh, we're pushing the data through the, the, uh, from each component. Uh, SQS has the ability to trigger a lambda, uh, and that lambda will pick up the, the messages from, from the queue. So we're, uh, we're batch, uh, the, each message is, a, is from a station, um, and it's a minute packet of data coming from the station. So if we had uh, 10 stations uh, arriving on the minute, we would have 10 packets of data. Uh, the, um, uh, the calibration uh, uh, lambda will pick up 10 uh, messages at a time, so we're batch processing. This is, has a number of advantages, such as uh, cost saving, for we're not paying for the, the warm-up of each of those lambdas. Um, now, uh, the calibration is uh, it ties into what I was talking about with the um, with the voltage. So at the moment we have voltages, uh, but we want temperatures. So at this point we we convert those uh, voltages to temperature, but the um, uh, the 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 conversion isn't linear. Um, so you can imagine a, a polynomial. Uh, there's a number of different uh, uh, calibration coefficients, and we're applying that through uh, for this data. So once we've done our calibration, we're moving on to, to our quality control. Um, I mentioned about how it's, uh, this is the, the memory of our, of our weather for the nation and how it's of this high quality data. At this point, we do a lot of different quality control checks, uh, but one of those is something like range. So uh, a temperature should never be below minus 50 and uh, above 40 degrees, for example, especially in the UK. Um, and if it, it goes beyond that boundary, we'd see that as erroneous data. 
So then we're pushing it onto a database. Uh, this is a NoSQL database called Dynamo. So uh, Amazon provides uh, this. So uh, that's similar to something like Mongo or, or Redis. And um, we need a, a, a cache at this point or, uh, because the, the next component is using uh, a large, uh, going back 24 hours to, to make those um, uh, a number of uh, calculations. So Dylan, uh, in Dylan's uh, demo, we looked at all of those parameters uh, on the side there, and those are what we call derived products. So up until this point, it's all raw data, sub-minute data that we don't disseminate to, uh, to our customers. And we do this for, for a number of reasons, but one is that the quality goes up as we average. Um, so um, uh, this component does uh, uh, churns for all of that raw data and, and creates that, um, those derived products. So it should be noted that, like uh, uh, I mentioned about the, the uh, push mechanisms, and uh, Dynamo has the ability to stream its data. So as the data arrives, it streams it to the next component, so that ultimately triggers the, uh, that lambda. And then we then uh, do a number of quality control checks against the derived products. So then once we've done that flow of data, we then store the data into a, um, into a, a relational database. And we're using AWS's uh, Aurora serverless database. Um, uh, you, so all of the data that you saw in that demo is stored, and we're going back by uh, 10, 15 years. So th that data is made available via a REST API, so you can see the API gateway next to the computer there, and uh, that allows uh, um, systems uh, external to SurfaceNet to be able to query um, large sets of data via uh, HTTP. Now on the left there, you've got a, a, a pub sub or publish subscribe mechanism, and we're using SNS, which is uh, Amazon's um, uh, simple notification service. And uh, this allows uh, subscribers to, to, uh, to get that data as soon as it arrives. And hopefully you'll see that in the next demo. I can tell you guys love demos, so we've got one more. Um, so this is an example of one of the applications that will be using uh, the data that SurfaceNet is producing. Um, this is called the Defense Forecaster. So the Defense Forecaster will be used by uh, weather observers or Met Office analysts, cool, the data's coming through. Uh, the analysts uh, at a number of the man sites around the country, so the 60 man sites, they'll, they'll be at the sites to basically observe the data and also to submit data. The data they submit will be used to create METARs, and METARs are basically weather information reports that other um, weather organizations and aviation authorities and pilots will use to see if it's safe to fly and land at certain areas in the country. So you can see the uh, two wind dials slightly twitching, and that is uh, the example. That's an example of the push mechanism. Push mechanism in action. So those data, that those uh, dials are getting data from the SNS topic that Rowan talked about. Um, that's getting pushed through in packets of 15 seconds and coming through every 15 seconds. Uh, and then that is streamed across the dial for that period of time. We also have the push mechanism in action at the top uh, where we've got summary observations. Now that is, uh, represents the um, minutely observations. They have different latency requirements, so they come through on different topics. So the wind comes through on a different topic because it has to come through uh, every 10 seconds, 15 seconds or so. We have a number of uh, missing fields. But that's because we don't have all the sensors attached. But once we've got all the sensors attached at this station, should be a less sad sight on this dashboard. Um, so as well as the, the push API that supplies this system with data, we've also got um, the pull API supplying it. So we um, can also, similarly to SurfaceNet, um, query historical data for a number of those derived products. So here's dry bulb temperature for the last seven minutes. And yeah, we can add in another variable, um, concrete temperature. And yeah, again, we can, we can compare those and see how they change um, over time. Again, a user might be interested in how that data is changing and if it potentially seems slightly different to what they expect, because obviously they'll be at the site itself. 
So some of this functionality seems quite similar to what we demoed with the uh, Surface Net um, interface, but it's worth noting that those application, this application and Surface Net will be run by different people, uh, will have different use cases. So this is basically an example of a set of users who will be consuming Surface Net and who ha have their own custom functionality that they need to apply. So the um, the Met Office has been on a journey with the with cloud adoption, and uh, we started that journey about four years ago. Um, and on that, along that journey, we've uh, we've played with uh, with service and in a number of different of our, uh, applications. And up until uh, Surface that we we weren't really challenging uh, from a from a consumption of uh, of, of the number of the, the amount of data. And one of the concerns here is that. Is it going to be too expensive? Um, and we mitigated that, those concerns by utilizing the, uh, the the calculator that is in AWS a lot, uh, using the the guidance that is provided by AWS in of all the different components. Um, and we you know, we built up a, a model of how much we thought it was going to be. And those mo those numbers looked good, uh, certainly within budget. But then we also went for a number of uh, actual sort of running uh, data at load through the system to see whether th those cost numbers were correct. And so far, you know, there's been no sort of gotchas on, on the, the amounts. It's proven to be, uh, to be cheaper than we thought it would be. Um, but I'm not going to, you know, uh, rose tint it. It is more expensive than running, say, EC2s. Um, but you get a lot of um, uh, scaling out of the box and um, the fact that it's uh, no ops or, or low ops. Um, some of the challenges that we we faced is that, for example, uh, the coders infrastructure, that, uh, sorry, the infrastructure as code that we um, uh, that we use is CloudFormation, and um, I don't think that any of us love uh, CloudFormation. It's incredibly verbose. Um, in fact, uh, we uh, the YAML that uh, that represents that our infrastructure far outstrips the business uh, Python that we've got, which makes us all very sad. Um, I think if we had our time again, we would do CDK. I mean, uh, uh, for us, that ship had sailed. Uh, we weren't going to uh, change tack uh, once, uh, you know, this project's been running for about uh, a year and a half. Um, and, you know, CDK certainly sounds like it, it could uh, solve some of our, um, our sadness. Um, some of the other things that we've uh, that we've learned is that uh, you saw it's a very microservice architecture, uh, and originally, uh, and I said, said that the architecture that I showed you was only a, a small window to, to the system. Um, we originally went for single repos for for each component. It kind of made sense at the time that sort of uh, to reduce sort of like you know cognitive load of the of the component. It was a single responsibility where. You know that that code existed there, um, and but what we found is uh, as the repo, uh, as the components uh, um, grew, so did the repos, and that meant we had uh, sort of you know all of that uh, administrative burden. Um, we've kind of uh, changed uh, changed tack on that now, and we've gone with more of a sort of uh, a hybrid of um, monolithic repo and and um, single repos, where we have themed so. Uh, themes of Lambda, so that the system that you saw in that uh, architecture probably would be a single repo. Um, another thing that we, we found is the, the difficulty of uh, having a development uh, environment uh, perfectly replicating the serverless environment. And um, uh, one of the ways that we, we overcome that was to mock uh, all of the interactions. So all of the SDKs that we use for uh, talking to the ADOS components, we mock out. And then we do a lot of the dev in complete isolation of AWS. So we're, you know, we're we're, we're writing the, the code, the business logic, and then we're then uh, running a, our unit tests and component tests, exercising the component in the way that we think it's going to uh, be exercised in the real environment, and then we then push it to, to the AWS. And for most part, that work has worked really well. But there's been occasional times when the SDK or our uh, mocking of the SDK hasn't been quite right. At which point we've uh, we've used the Lambda sort of uh, GUI, which has a sort of a, a, bro um, a, a simple IDE, which um, allows us to, to debug. But we've also um, 
utilize the uh, Cloud9, which is a full um, ID working in AWS uh, with breakpoints, etc. So you can actually interact with the Lambda code uh, uh, directly, and that's been really useful. Another thing is that we, you know, we we, uh, we integrate uh, test all of our components in AWS, and you can imagine the deployment and the and the running of the uh, the integration test just to find out that your integration test wasn't quite ready is quite a slow process. Um, and so uh, what we found is that we've been able to run the integration test from our local environment. Um, so we're interacting with the real AWS components, um, but uh, we're running it uh, <coughs> locally, so we can uh, put in our uh, breakpoints, we can make our quick iteration, and that's really improved the cycle time of getting our code out. Um, so, so uh, I hope you've enjoyed uh, the insight we hopefully have given you into why I think serverless is probably the future, um, definitely the future. Um, uh, we've, from a, a point of view of our team, we've certainly found it reliable and robust and cheap, and for a system as important as the weather observations for the country, it's uh, proved itself to be really good. Uh, that being said, there have obviously been issues, and one thing we've probably not mentioned is the sort of knowledge barrier and paradigm shift. I think when you're designing a, a system in serverless, it's quite a, a mind change compared to designing a sort of servered architecture. It's, uh, it's getting your uh, head around the, the real capabilities that serverless can offer you. But once you sort of get around that and, and see that serverless is really powerful. It kind of allows companies like the Met Office who are focused and have their skills in data delivery and data analysis to, to focus on that and not really have to worry as much about the infrastructure. You can give that over to AWS. And similarly, for a company like CACI who are good at software delivery and want to focus on that, we don't want to worry as much about some of the infrastructural pain. So for a, com a couple of companies like this, uh, trying to deliver a project as big as this, serverless has proved itself to be perfect. So thank you very much for coming uh, today. Hopefully that you've seen that you know, this is a, a large scale system uh, running at sort of huge amounts of data for it. And you know, as Dylan said, we believe that serverless is, is ready for this type of environment. So we're now open to taking questions. Thank you so much, Dylan and Rowan, for the for the great talk. I think uh, everybody will agree with me that didn't look like that was your first talk. That was quite slick. <laughs> so that was very good. So well done, well done for that. Do we have any questions? There's one at the back there, and there's one right there. So, yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I have one question about moving from, I guess, in-house infrastructure to a service such as AWS for a system that has a very long lifetime. You say the last version wasn't really, you know, your servers where the previous version was released over 10 years ago and servers haven't even been patched with updates because there's no skill to maintain this kind of system. Um, and the issue was there was kind of proprietary parts that had been developed by contractors. But it feels like you're still using proprietary services now they're just in the cloud. What will happen, I mean, how cu closely coupled are you to AWS? And what would happen if AWS deprecates LAM the Lambda APIs you're using or there are issues where you can no longer use AWS because there's some big American company and this is a UK government. Like, could you move to another provider or host in-house? Yeah, so um, uh, specifically with the IPR, we, we own all of the code now, so we can make those changes. But uh, with the concern of uh, vendor lock-in, I mean, that's a, a balance, isn't it? You can either go with like being vendor agnostic um, or being tied in. And we've very clearly gone with the tied in. And uh, I think that the... Personally, I, I although I don't love vendor login, it is a concern. It you know if if like, God forbid we went to war with America or you know, uh, <laughs> or, or or if Trump decided that we weren't going to have any trade agreements, for example, um, we wouldn't be able to use Amazon. We would have to migrate. Um, but I think those risks are quite low. Um, they're uh, and they're, they're ones that we've we've accepted. Um, the, I mean, maybe they're not because he's a bit crazy, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, the, the the advantages of of going all in 
you know, I just I think outweigh those concerns of, of being vendor locked in. And sure, we don't know what's going to be in, in five years' time. You know, I, I think that we uh, we are not alone in uh, in AWS adoption. I think that there would be a significant backlash if AWS decided that they were going to deprecate Lambda or change an SDK. And to, to you know, I, I've been working in the AWS space for the last three years, and. <coughs> Uh, although the, the only thing that I've seen that's changed from a lander perspective is that, you know, like Node, whatever, has been deprecated and you have to, which is a good process anyway, isn't it? Um, I've never seen them change uh, an SDK which, uh, you know, deprecated it to the point where it no longer works. So um, maybe we'll see some of that. But I personally have accepted uh, vendor lock-in. I know that it's not perfect, but <coughs> equally the benefits uh, uh, outweigh the, the negatives. Great, thank you. We have time for just one more question. I think at the back there. Um, I just wondered, um, obviously, you know, you can test your Lambda functions in isolation and you spoke a little bit about integration testing. Obviously it's a system with a lot of moving parts. How did you go about system testing uh, something like this. So, um, we, so our integration tests have a, a couple of levels uh, because, yeah, as you say, there are a lot of moving parts. Um, we try and test them piecewise. So, because of uh, the sort of Q lambda model, um, we try and we integration test a couple of lambdas together, and we sort of have that piecewise joining of tests going on. So, if there are issues, we don't need to try and work out where in the where in the huge data pipeline something's falling over. We get reasonably quick. Uh, feedback as to where about in the pipeline there's an issue. Uh, we also have general tests, throughput tests that make sure the whole system is flowing. But we made that we made that decision reasonably early on that we'd take the hit of the extra developer work to have a segmented integration test, just as because of the issues. Basically, you're saying that it's hard to know where where your system's falling over unless you've got feedback at each of those points. Is that right? Cool. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. If you have any questions, you are hanging around for the party afterwards, yes. I'm guessing. Yes, and so I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be by the ice cream, ice cream booth. So, yeah, <laughs> Let's thank them one more time for their time.